Good morning. Morning. That's almost time, I guess. So, um, welcome to all of you. Uh, what we're going to need to do is um, I need you to mute your mics, okay? Uh, and you can keep your videos up, that's fine. Um, we're supposed to go anywhere from about an hour and a half to two hours. And generally, uh, uh, from my uh, uh, lecturing and teaching experience, uh, I know about an hour through, we'll take a five minute break or so. Um, I'll field questions at the end. Um, and I, you have the ability to send me a message through chat. So uh, if anybody's having a problem, uh, as far as I'm moving too fast or uh, too slow or uh, it, uh, anything like that, you know, uh, do let me know through chat. Um, so it's 10 o'clock. Uh, this is uh, a lecture on uh, bird photography, ticks, tips and techniques. Um, and it's kind of uh, designed to help you uh, think and aim in the right direction as far as uh, photography of birds go. Uh, so the uh, skill level is gonna be extremely varied uh, with the group we have. So uh, I try not to talk up or talk down. If I use terminology or phrases someone doesn't know, do me a favor, send me a note during chat. So when we take that break, I can take a look at the questions and address them when we come back for that break. Um, there again, there's a last time I checked, there was about 36 people registered for this. If everybody arrived, uh, we um, uh, it'd be extremely difficult to leave your uh, mics unmuted. Okay, so uh, without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, again, my name is Michael McMinn. Uh, I'm the facilitator for the um, Bird SIG at the Green Valley Camera Club. Uh, I've been doing this now for, I started the SIG about, uh, oh, probably about almost close to two and a half years ago. Um, I'm not the best bird photographer. I'm not the worst either. Uh, I'm not a professional. I would consider myself uh, an advanced amateur in certain respects. Um, why I'm doing the lectures is because uh, I'm a natural born ham and I uh, lectured for almost 30 years of my life to adults. So uh, I'm pretty comfortable uh, on screen and in front of an audience. So let's get going. Okay, first thing is, um, uh, by the way, my email is up there on the screen. It's Mike4, M-I-K-E-F-O-R-E -E, at Comcast.net. Uh, you want to send me a, a email, questions, or anything like that, uh, please don't hesitate to use it. Uh, I also share my uh, cell phone number, uh, preferably for text messages rather than uh, calls to shoot the breeze. Uh, and my cell phone number is 810-516-0220. Okay? So that's kind of the housekeeping stuff I want to take care of. So let's take a look at the first slide. All right. Well, bird photography tips and techniques. Well, what do we got here? Well, we're looking at gear. We're going to talk about gear and what that can include everything from batteries to camera bodies to lenses to tripods uh, and assorted other things. Okay. We're also going to talk about camera settings. And uh, most of the settings involve three primary focuses. Uh, shutter speed, which is how fast the camera takes the picture. Uh, F-stop or aperture, which determines how much light comes into the camera. And ISO, which determines uh, how sensitive your sensor is going to be to the light coming through. We'll discuss these things in a bit more detail in a couple of minutes. And we're also gonna talk about tips for creating interesting images of birds. Uh, this bird is, is interesting just on its own merits. It's uh, called the elegant trogan. It's uh, 
a Mexican bird that uh, happens to uh, nest uh, up here in South. I think America. we're still seeing the open screen. What's that now? We're not getting the pictures. Oh God! We're you still on the first screen. You're still on the first screen, huh? Gotta love it. It never fails. Okay, that's good to know. All right. I always love it when things go wrong. Let's do this again. My apologies for this. Uh, I try to avoid this at all costs uh, and it always seems to happen. So can you see the screen now? No Hello? change. Pardon? No change. No, no. change. Okay, N not now, right? No. Okay, give me a second. This is what I hate about Zoom. Oh. Well, we're gonna do this. What the hell, we'll go here. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute, okay. It's the kind of stuff that drives me absolutely bananas. Uh, I like to look like I'm organized and uh, this doesn't help much. Anybody who's been in my SIG knows this happens on occasion. I don't understand why. So Let's take this again. Again, my humblest apologies. Not that that slices bread or anything like that, but. Let's do this one more time here. I usually try to anticipate this kind of thing, but uh, it doesn't always uh, react the same way, so. This is when I feel like throwing the uh, computer uh, through the wall or something like that, so. I'm about to say dirty things in a minute and that will be unprofessional as hell. Hold on. This is pissing me off to no end.
Okay. All right. Scroll. We'll do it the old fashioned way. And I'll wing it. I think we got it. You got it? Thank God. Okay. What are you seeing? Just uh, tips and tricks, right? Yeah, just a blank screen with, with tips and tricks. You got there another slide up there? Got three for, uh, three images in the corner. Oh, okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> let's go. We're going to go back. One more to here. Okay. Okay, uh, as I said before, we're talking about gear, and I'm sorry about the delay. Uh, it frustrates me more than me more than it does you, if you can believe that. I talk about uh, exposure settings, and I mentioned those already. Again, how to take interesting photos, as I was mentioning. Uh, everybody see the Trogan? Hello? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I just needed to make sure we're still rolling here. Uh, and also, this is actually, this is an interesting picture. It, uh, the bird on the left is a juvenile uh, European starling. The one on the right is the uh, adult uh, and it's feeding it. This was taken uh, at my home in Sports Creek, Michigan, uh, I believe last summer. I thought it was kind of an interesting shot. So we're gonna address several different things. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about gear. Okay, and one of the first things to think about and most people don't even think about it. They get a strap with their camera and they use it. Uh, usually the straps you get from your camera, uh, if you do any serious photography, is useless. One is too small. It cuts into your neck. It's fatiguing. Doesn't support your camera very well. So what I suggest, uh, especially for bird photography, if you get into uh, longer lenses like... Um, 70 to 200, uh, 100, 400, 200, 600. Uh, to use a strap more like the one on the left, this is Peak Design, that's what I use, and the one on the right, I'm not sure who the designer is there. Uh, and I generally carry my camera off a shoulder. I, um, I carry a bag on the left-hand side with water, snacks, and also my doubler in 1.4. And on my right shoulder, I carry my camera in this kind of way, which easy bring up to my eye and use it, okay? So um, next thing we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about memory cards. Uh, we have uh, pretty much two examples here. One on the left is called the Compact Flash. It's um, don't have a whole lot of cameras using those anymore. Um, it's a... Uh, uh, Used, it used to be used by people with higher end cameras. That's what they had them. These two here on the right are, um, uh, oh God, what's the, I can't remember the name. This is getting old stuff, it's crazy. Uh, is your, um, oh God, oh man, brain fart guys, I'm sorry. But basically, uh, the thing to remember with these, if you'll all notice, they mention GB, which is gigabytes. This is 64, this is 128, and this is 32, okay? What that does is determine how many pictures you can hold on your memory card, okay? Uh, when you're out shooting, uh, you know, uh, uh, the kids in the backyard of the grandkids, uh, you maybe didn't need a 32 or a 64 or 128 gig card. Uh, but when you're out shooting birds in rapid fire, uh, it tends to be, um, uh, you can fill up a card real quick and I've done it. The other thing to notice on the camera is it says MB slash S, that's megabits per second. What's that mean in English? That means 
how fast the camera can write to the card, okay? Means it transfers the information from the camera to the card. And uh, it involves something called the buffer, okay? And I don't wanna get deep into it, but if you don't have a sufficiently fast card that matches your camera, you're gonna have a problem with your camera stopping uh, functioning for any length of time necessary to empty the buffer, okay? Uh, and again, if you have questions about either of these things, uh, make sure to show me in the chat uh, at the break. Next is uh, batteries. Okay, these happen to be Sony because that's why I currently shoot. This is a battery pack. Now I use that on all my cameras. I had Canon prior to this uh, and now I have Sony. Uh, I have it for two reasons. One, uh, the kind of shooting I do eats up batteries very rapidly. So having two batteries built in is extremely useful. But another thing is I have extremely large hands, okay? So oftentimes on some of the smaller bodies, my bottom two fingers in the bottom part of my palm is not supported at all. So I use it both for batteries and for um, more comfort holding the camera. Uh, again, uh, batteries, uh, this is a double charger. This is your manufacturer um, uh, charger for your batteries. Generally, if you buy the manufacturer's equipment, it uh, tends to be a tad uh, more expensive, not a tad, usually a hell of a lot more expensive, okay? Uh, you can go with um, generic or uh, off market, in a sense, not uh, Sony or Canon or Nikon. Uh, the choice is yours. Uh, there have been problems with Canon batteries uh, that were uh, not uh, Canon, uh, not holding a charge and so on and so forth. So your decision is you got to pick what you buy. Uh, I generally buy brand name because I have no other uh, vices other than photography. I don't uh, uh, drink around wild women or smoke anymore. And my wild woman is as old as I am. So uh, I stick pretty much uh, to photography. So uh, the choice is yours. Uh, but before you purchase, uh, always go on and review uh, the equipment, the battery, the charger, whatever, okay? Uh, the last thing on a slide is uh, card readers. You can buy all kinds of them. They generally are uh, generic or uh, I don't believe any of the manufacturers uh, produce their own card readers. Excuse me while I drank some coffee here. One thing to remember is uh, it probably is a good idea to find out how fast your card can be read by your card reader. Because uh, what happens uh, when you transfer information from your card to your computer, uh, the length of time uh, will vary with not the speed of the card, but the speed of the uh, reader, card reader. Also uh, in bird photography, usually, you don't have to, usually we shoot in what's called the raw files. They tend to be extremely large. Okay, so uh, before going out buying something on the cheap, uh, you're gonna get one that's gonna pretty much last for an extremely long time, there are no moving parts. I would research the card reader, okay? Uh, a lot of the purchases you're probably going to make are going to be um, uh, of equipment that's gonna last for a relatively long time. Another thing you need to think about is with bird photography, birds tend to be kind of small. They can be as small as an inch and a half to two inches to as large as let's say a sandhill crane. And to capture the image of let's say a small bird, you need a longer lens, okay? This is, uh, is a shot I took at Raptor free flight uh, at uh, Desert Museum. Uh, it used, I think this one was an instance where the birds are relatively close and relatively large. 
I shot what's called about a 70 to 200 lens, which was quite adequate. Okay, this one is a Costas Hummingbird. That, by the way, is a great horned owl. This Costas Hummingbird was shot, I believe, at the Hummingbird Aviary at Desert Museum. And I believe it was shot with a 100 to 400. The idea is you wanna fill the frame with as much of the bird as possible, which usually requires getting closer or a longer lens. One problem with birds is you can't often get very close at all. So you need to compensate with a longer lens. And here's some examples of a long lens. Uh, uh, the idea, buy, rent, or borrow a long lens. I wouldn't suggest you go out and buy, uh, this is an 800 F5.6, would probably runs close to $14,000. I wouldn't suggest you go out and uh, buy this lens uh, because it's um, uh, extremely expensive and you don't know what, whether you're going to, uh, you lost the screen, right? Hello? It's there. It's there. It's it's there. Back? Okay, all right. Wish I'd get it back here. <clears throat> I gotta love this. There we go. All right, fine. Ignore the little thing down in the uh, count corner. I will take care of that in just a second. So this lens is terribly expensive, but gets you relatively close. Okay, uh, this is generally used by professionals. Um, uh, people who shoot wildlife and birds uh, for a living. Uh, and bird photography is a segment of wildlife photography. So wildlife photographers can be shooting moose, bison, elk, wolves, and so on and so forth, other types of things. So this type of lens would be somebody that would be uh, a professional wildlife photographer. Some people who got a lot of money may, uh, may buy it, but... Uh, this is a uh, 400 millimeter, uh, what's called a prime lens. It only is 400 mil, okay? A matter of fact, my first long lens I bought from my Canon was a 400 mil. The problem with this, if you wanna adjust the image in, inside the screen or on your screen or your viewfinder, is you've either gotta step back or move closer, okay? So it kind of eliminates uh, the flexibility. But if you have a zoom lens, okay, it gives you the ability to adjust your focal length. And focal lengths are generally expressed in millimeters, okay? Um, and they're, all the images are based, or the um, size of the image is based on the 35 millimeter film camera. So, um, it's, uh, uh, it's something that it's a new language and you'll have to, it'll take some time, but you'll get used to it. So generally a lot of bird photog photographers uh, go with zoom lenses, such as me. I have a 200, 600 zoom. Uh, a pro uh, bird photographer would probably go with uh, something like a 400 or 600 F4. F4, by the way, is how much light the uh, camera lets in. Okay, um, let me do one thing. It might go off just for a second again. You're back, right? Okay. Yeah, it's here. It's here. Okay. Yeah, you've got right. it. I'm trying to get rid of the damn screen down here. Uh, and my uh, computer is not cooperating, so we're going to have to hang in with it for a while. Okay, next thing we're, uh, uh, sorry if it's distracting. Next thing we're going to talk about is um, uh, tripods and heads. Okay, uh, a lot of people have a nasty habit. They, they get their gear or they buy, buy some gear, uh, um, a Nikon or a Canon, and it comes it's with a kit lens, they're called and stuff, something like a 
55 to 210 or a 70 to 300, and they go out and buy an inexpensive tripod and they think they're set. Well, when you start using lenses like 200, 600, or 100, 400, which my 200, 600, I think, weighs 3.1 pounds. So what happens is when you put that on a flimsy tripod or a cheap tripod, uh, they are not stable. And you're talking about a lens that costs $2,000, $2,500. Uh, you don't want that falling on the ground, trust me, for a multitude of reasons. So generally, it's a good idea to research tripods and figure you're gonna buy one tripod or possibly two, depending on your age and how long you plan to shoot. Um, and uh, the best um, tripod head, head or one of them, okay, one of the two best is called a gimbal head. On the left, this is a gimbal head, which allows you, is used frequently with bird photography. Uh, especially uh, birds in flight. It allows you to adjust uh, the level up and down and it allows you also to do something called panning, okay? And panning is you follow the bird in the viewfinder while you're taking, taking pictures. I prefer that. Uh, many bird photographers prefer a gimbal head. The one on the right is called a ball head. Uh, some people prefer ball heads. A lot of it is what you get used to. Gimbals tend to be a little more expensive than ball heads, uh, but I believe personally, it's a personal opinion, not to be confused with any kind of truth, is I prefer the gimbal head and the flexibility it gives me. I've had ball heads and I've never really been pleased with them at all, okay? So again, uh, uh, a steady tripod, uh, a good quality uh, tripod head. Okay, next we're gonna talk about, talk about knowing your camera. Over on the left-hand screen, you see something that uh, looks like a kind of a weird diagram of some sort. Um, and it gives you circles with uh, larger and larger black uh, leading to a small white center, okay? Down below that, you see an image of a stick figure running and you'll see numbers below it, one one thousand to one half. Okay, let's look at the top first. The top, that's your, um, called your uh, f-stop. And what it does is determines how much light comes into the camera sensor. Okay, so uh, if you look at the diagrams up on the left, that's 1.4 and if you look, the image, the stick figure in front is clear and everything else is out of focus. If you look over at um, F32, what you see is the uh, image in front is in focus and so is the uh, mountains in the background and so on and so forth. So uh, the thing to remember about this is that your depth of field it's called, which uh, how much of the foreground and the background will be in focus, a lot of it is determined by your f-stop. And as the f-stop gets what we call smaller, okay, not by number, this is confusing as hell, drives people nuts, me also, okay. As the, the hole gets smaller, the depth of field gets greater. As the hole gets wider, the depth of, uh, depth of field gets shallower. If you look down, two things are interrelated. Down below, we see shutter speeds. Over on the left, we've got one one thousand, and over on the right, we've got one half, okay? And that's one half a second. The other is one one thousandth of a second. What you have to remember is your sensor, the camera sensor, okay? responds to light. To get a properly exposed image, it has to get the wrong, right amount of light. What generally determines the right amount of light, and for years, basically the things most photographers tried to control were f-stop and shutter speed. And also they set what's called the ISO. If you're an old, um, uh, 
film photographer, you know, that used to be called ASA, now it's ISO. So what that does is that determines how much light your sensor is going to need. I'm not trying to make things complex, really. So what you've got to realize is if you let lice, let lice less, excuse me, let less light in with a smaller f-stop, what has to happen is you have to allow more light to come in by increasing the length of your exposure. So what you have to realize, the more sensitive, okay, the more light you let into the camera with your f-stop, your lens, the less time the sensor has to be exposed. So that affects shutter speed, okay? And in the past, generally we set our ISO and left it. So what you've got to realize is everything is about uh, adequate exposure. And adequate exposure is based on the amount of light that reaches the sensor. The amount of light that reaches the sensor is determined by your f-stop and your shutter speed, okay? And ISO determines how sensitive your um, sensor is, okay? The thing to remember is it's not so much, and I'm throwing a lot of information at you and some of your heads are spinning. What you gotta realize is it takes a while to get comfortable with this. So oftentimes it's not a bad idea when you first start out to shoot in what's called auto or program. There is nothing wrong with using auto and program. But what you have to do is you have to learn what the results are. So the key to being a good bird photographer, just as an amateur, is viewing your images after they've been shot and seeing what the settings were. And it will tell you when you view, or depending on the program you're using to view your slides, it will tell you what shutter speed, what f-stop, and what ISO was used. And we'll talk more about this later, okay? Uh, here's a kind of a chart to show you what uh, uh, like ISOs you would use on different lighting conditions. Uh, bright sunlight, uh, today is bright and sunny, a few clouds in the air, okay? So you could use an extremely low ISO. Uh, and there's been a big debate for years about you should use the lowest ISO you possibly can. The problem with lowest ISOs is it restricts the amount of shutter speed you can use, which means it's very difficult to shoot a bird that's on the move all the time, okay? So remember, the amount of lay available light is uh, determines what your ISO possibly should be set at. And we'll talk more about that later. The last thing I'm going to talk about here uh, briefly is metering modes. And what is metering modes? That uh, back in the old days, the built the SLR cameras had light meters built in. Okay, and what it did was it read the amount amount of light coming in from outside, rather having a handheld light meter. You had one built in the camera. So if you see in that bottom part of the slide, you've got evaluative center weighted and spot, okay? With uh, oftentimes the uh, most frequently used is evaluative. What that means is it measures the light from all over the viewfinder, okay? So it'll measure uh, light in, a, in a, a, sh a shadowy area, it'll measure the sky and so on and so forth. Center weighted means exactly what it says. It's going to be measure the light, what the center of uh, the lens is aimed at. And the other is spot, which measures, for example, with small birds, oftentimes spot metering is the best. It's a relatively small image. So you wanna make sure you get the best lighting on that image itself. So again, f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO, determine exposure, okay? ISO is sensitivity in metering determines what amount of light <coughs> is coming in and it can be just from a single spot with spot metering or 
a larger area evaluative. Okay, again, if you have any questions on this, just send them in chat when we take our break. Again, uh, we're gonna be repetitive here because uh, what I always say is uh, repetition is the mother of learning. Okay, so this is called the uh, exposure triangle. Okay, and basically it shows the relationship of shutter speed, aperture and ISO. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that. Uh, I hope to do some uh, intro photography classes that will get into that more in detail. Okay, um, but it determines exposure. Again, it's called the exposure triangle. Okay, now shutter speed in relationship to ISO. One thing that, uh, that I've been doing now probably for almost two years is used what we call, I call floating ISO. In actuality, it's uh, the uh, auto ISO. Uh, most of your, a lot of your cameras will allow you to put auto ISO in. What does that mean? Well, you can adjust your shutter speed. You can adjust your f-stop. Remember, shutter speed lets you stop action, okay, or blur. Uh, F-stop, on the other hand, determines the amount of depth of field, which means the amount of the background, let's say, that is uh, in focus. But what happens is the ISO floats, okay, or adjusts. Range uh, of ISO, let's say, for uh, stills can be from 100 to 3200. One thing you have to remember is your camera has a maximum ISO that it will uh, will use. Uh, so if you use uh, auto ISO without any uh, range or limitations, okay, what happens is you can get into an ISO that causes a problem with your pictures. We used to call it grain with, uh, with film cameras. Uh, now it's called noise. Uh, noise can be very disruptive to your images. Uh, but some of your more advanced cameras today and some of the more advanced um, software, processing software, allows you to adjust uh, for noise. So uh, again, uh, for novices or you new, new guys right now, uh, your main concern is probably put it out at all and leave it there for a little while. I'm not saying forever, but leave it there. Uh, also, uh, you have the ability to set a minimum and maximum shutter speed. Uh, so that makes sure that the shutter speed can't fall. Let's say you're trying to shoot a bird and you don't want it to fall below a certain point, let's say like one five hundredth. And this is something that you'll get, you'll learn as we, as you progress as a bird photographer. This one's a shutter speed chart. Uh, excuse me, I got to go back. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, there we go. We're back to this thing here. We're getting rid of this. Can you still see the images? Somebody? Well, if I don't hear anything, I assume. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, this is a shutter speed chart. And basically, um, Another thing that, that's uh, too deep to get into heavy right now is generally photography, uh, photography talks about exposure in what we call f-stops, okay? And uh, there's a relationship between f-stops and shutter speed. And I'm not gonna go into the correlation right now, okay? Uh, that's something that, that requires a little bit more than five minute blurb on a screen here. One thing you got to remember uh, is if you want to shoot a bird in flight, okay, um, I shoot at 13200th and I've gone as high as 18,000th of a second. I do that for two reasons. Uh, one, a lot of it determines bird size. Uh, two, but I'm an old man. I'm 74 and my hands aren't as steady as they used to be. Now, I'm holding a camera that weighs, uh, with the lens, about eight pounds, it gets kind of shaky. So I have to uh, adjust and uh, negate the effects of what's called camera shake. Uh, camera shake uh, means as you push the shutter, 
the image in the camera becomes blurred. Uh, it appears to be moving up and down. We'll see an example of that in a couple of minutes. Now, if you're shooting somebody on a bike or something like that, uh, you can probably get away with one five hundredth or one one thousandth of a second. And if you're shooting a, little, uh, a group of individuals like at a wedding or something like that, you can probably get away with, you know, uh, one two fiftieth, one one hundredth, depending. Okay, one thing to remember with birds is the closer the bird is, the faster the required shutter speed. The smaller the bird is, the faster the required shutter speed. So if you want to practice birds in flight, and we'll talk a little bit about it later, is we probably want to shoot uh, one two thousandths or, excuse me, if we want to practice birds in flight, pick big ones. Examples, great blue heron, sandhill crane, great egrets, okay? Those types of birds are easier to work with. Another one is gulls, okay? They're, uh, they don't move that fast and sometimes they soar, which is easier to get. So what you wanna do is when you practice this stuff, practice on easy stuff first, okay? That's the best recommendation I can give you. Okay, let's see, fast frame rates. Now, one thing um, a lot of people uh, back with film, uh, you didn't have the option of, of shooting rapid um, rapid frame rates, okay, um, because you had to have a motor drive. Now with our digital cameras, we can shoot rapid frame rates. rates. A lot of people still shoot single frame, okay. One thing to think about, one is there's that issue of camera shake, okay? Even if you squeeze it nicely, sometimes there's camera shake, depending on your shutter speed, okay? Also, birds move and move rather rapidly. So let's say you're shooting something like a ruby crown kinglet that's all over the place, okay? If you shoot one shot, you'll be lucky to get an image because it'll move. But if you shoot, let's say three to five frames a second, what happens is you're going to at least get at least possibly one, two, and possibly more usable frames of that bird. And you'll catch it in different positions. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. So I generally suggest to people to shoot uh, anywhere from three to five frames a second, okay? Uh, and see what kind of results you get. See if you like it or not. Okay, uh, you can't read any of these images right now. This is a one second strip. This is 10 images. Okay, here's what it looks like. Okay, if you look at the left hand screen name, name, named label one or one, is this was at something called uh, Avian Adventure uh, and it involved uh, pretty much three different birds, uh, a great horned owl, this bird, uh, just taking off, you may not be able to see it so well in number one, but you should in two, is called a European or uh, Euro-Asian eagle owl, I believe it's called. It's a huge bird, you can tell. Um, but if you'll notice, the time that has elapsed between exposure number one and two is one-tenth of a second. Look at the change in the bird's wing positions. Look at the position of the hands of the people watching. Nothing has changed on the people, uh, but the bird's uh, wings have made a major change in wing position. Shot three, another change in wing position, okay? Shot four, again, the difference in time between three and four is the same as one and two. One-tenth of a second. Okay, image five, other wing position. And notice the bird is getting closer because it's flying towards me. Number six, another position. Number seven, and what this, this does is it gives me 10 shots to pick from as far as 
what I think is the best wing position, what is the best background. If I was doing this again and went back and did it again, I would change my position about uh, probably oh, a foot, foot and a half to two feet to the left. And I would use uh, a longer focal length. What that would do, it would remove the people on the right and the trainer, trainer from the left from the image and have only the bird. Right now, unfortunately, the bird is, uh, the picture of the bird is cluttered by the, the desert, uh, the people on the right and left. So from a tactical standpoint uh, or artistic standpoint, the picture sucks, okay? But again, I learned from it. If I put myself in that same situation again, how to address it, how to handle it. Okay, one of the best ways to clean up background is just move to right or left. Okay, all right, so that's uh, again, a one second uh, shot range, 10 shots, one tenth of a second each. Okay, uh, now priority modes. Most of our cameras have multiple priorities. A and S, those are aperture, and shutter speed. Some, I think Canon uses TV. Um, I think Sony uses S, but those, and the third one is M. It's not highlighted, okay? Uh, generally, I recommend for a novice or, or new to bird photography, okay? I suggest using auto. Uh, interesting, some of the cameras, for example, some bridge cameras, I know the ones from Nikon, have what's called a, a bird photography setting, okay? Uh, some people will use the sports setting. Uh, the idea in both the shutter speeds uh, tend to be uh, faster. Also to clarify the term bridge camera, basically it's a point and shoot camera that has a rather large focal length difference. I have a bridge camera that I use to travel with in my backup camera. It's a 24 millimeter, which is considered wide angle, to 600 millimeter, which is considered a uh, super zoom, okay? Uh, basically, when I started shooting birds, I shot aperture, excuse me, shutter priority. My thought was, uh, I wanna make sure I stop the bird. Many people, many bird photographers shot aperture priority. They wanted to control the background image, the depth of field. So one thing you'll discover as you talk to people who've been shooting for a long time, doesn't have to be professionals. Most of us have an opinion about something, but I always clarify it's not, uh, it's my opinion not to be confused with facts. So uh, I would take anything anyone says with a grain of salt and do not swear by it. I've talked to people, uh, I've been working with people on bird uh, photography uh, uh, trips from the camera club and so on and so forth. And they'll say, so-and-so told me always do this or always use this. Uh, one thing I hesitate to say is I never say always because there's a exceptions to every rule. Okay, and remember the information you receive from somebody else oftentimes is an opinion. Uh, it's fascinating. I taught in healthcare for years and students wouldn't ask questions in class. They'd walk out and turn to somebody aside next to them and say, well, what was he talking about? What did he say? And I would tell these people that, gee, probably the best thing to do is talk to me because I had had uh, approximately uh, 25 plus years in respiratory care, uh, wouldn't I be able to answer a question better than somebody who's been sitting next to you for just three months? So I encourage adults, uh, usually it's not a big it's a problem with adults as it is with uh, uh, college kids and uh, grade school kids, is you got a question, ask it, okay? Uh, uh, this form is not real good for asking questions because uh, I can't focus on you. I can't see you uh, because I used to ask uh, questions of the group 
and I can't uh, direct my questions because I can't see the entire group. So I would suggest when you're first starting out, try auto for a while, okay? After that, then start moving to other. Also read research. Your best friend is Google. Google will send you to articles, to uh, YouTube videos uh, on lenses, uh, photography techniques, birding, wildlife, so on and so forth. So don't hesitate to Google. If you don't know how to Google, ask your grandkids or ask me, okay? I use Google all the time, all right? I never have, hesitate to ask questions. So, uh, but uh, until you become comfortable, work with auto, but always review your images. And don't sit there and say, oh, they suck. Okay, well, okay, find out why do they suck? Or why are they good? Or what can you do to make it better? Because your judgment of your images will change. I've been shooting bird photography since 2007. What I accepted in 2007, which is 14 years ago, and what I accept now are a world apart, okay? Also, uh, this is uh, the example of <clears throat> aperture priority. This is a screen similar to what I had on, on uh, my Canon. I'm sure it's similar to Nikon. I've got a similar screen, uh, I'm sure, on my Sony. Uh, F11 is the uh, S-stop. This is aperture priority, that means that the aperture will always be F11 every time you take a picture. Also, the ISO is set at 800. Every time you take a picture, that ISO is going to be 800. But what is gonna change is going to be your shutter speed, okay? So uh, that is gonna vary with your F-stop, your ISO, and also the amount of, amount of light coming in. That's aperture priority. This, on the other hand, is shutter priority. It's listed as TV, okay? That's time value, okay? AV is aperture value. Here, the ISO is set at 100. The shutter speed is 1 80th of a second, okay? So what is the variable going to be here? It's going to be your aperture aperture. If it needs to, it will open the uh, aperture as wide as it can get, okay? Uh, and when you get into more advanced photography, this is where you start uh, paying attention to what they call, when they talk about speed of a lens, they're not talking shutter speed. They are talking how sensitive it is to light, okay? And that varies. Uh, a fast uh, 800 millimeter lens would be f4. A fast uh, 7200 lens is f28. So there's a great variety of uh, what is considered fast. But again, fast relative to a lens is its aperture opening, how much light it lets in. That's what fast means. Okay. All righty. Next. How about autofocus? Single autofocus point for perched birds. Oftentimes that's a good idea. You can get away with it is perched birds. Uh, also depending on their size. Also, if possible, aim at the eye. Verdant is one of my favorite birds. It's a little tiny thing, not much bigger than a hummingbird. And trying to aim at the eye is extremely difficult, okay? So the larger the bird, the easier it is to focus on the bird's eye. Interesting thing, a lot of your new mirrorless cameras, uh, especially from, I believe it's Canon now, has the ability to focus on a bird's eye. I have a Sony and the Sony has, uh, has ability to focus on an animal's eye, but it hasn't got to a bird's eye yet. I'm hoping with a firmware upgrade That'll change. By the way, firmware upgrade means the um, uh, the uh, software inside the camera that controls how the camera works and what it does. That's called firmware, and that's generally upgraded by the manufacturer. So try and aim at the bird uh, and use uh, a single autofocus point. 
Okay, because uh, oftentimes little birds are being tree limbs and so on and so forth. That can be a real pain because oftentimes you'll see shots where the camera focused on a limb. So that's why you oftentimes go autofocus. Matter of fact, now I go off autofocus and go right to manual focus um, to uh, focus on a bird uh, behind some limbs. And it works relatively well, okay? Let's look at, uh, this is an example of multiple focus points, okay? Uh, birds in flight, you wanna go to dynamic focus points. Uh, oftentimes it's called tracking. Uh, what happens is the camera has the ability to lock onto a bird and to follow it across the sky, okay? Um, and it usually is, is uh, important to have multiple focus points because trust me, trying to uh, put a single spot on a bird flying across the sky uh, and rarely will you ever have the whole frame filled with bird uh, it can be a real issue, okay? So uh, oftentimes you need to go to dynamic focus modes, which means it follows an image. Uh, you can adjust the sensitivity of focus, meaning um, uh, you can lock on to the bird, let's say, okay, which helps uh, hold on to it. If let's say it flies between a, a pole and, and your camera, okay, uh, then what happens, the camera will pick it up immediately. Uh, you can have sensitivity of focus, uh, as I just mentioned, and set up to uh, continuous autofocus. Uh, I leave my camera almost always on continuous autofocus. Uh, some people like single autofocus. Um, uh, everybody has their own preference and there's a rationale why. Okay, let's see if I can get this silly thing off again. Uh, I'm going to kill this thing. I don't know why it comes up. Uh, we'll just do this again. Uh, my apologies. Um, I'm sure it'll come up again, but uh, that, that's what makes life we're living. Okay. So, all right, here we go. There's an uh, example of, uh, of varied focus points. If you look at the, I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see my cursor, which uh, freaks me out. So see the little dot down on uh, near the bottom? That is where you set the camera to focus uh, most prominently on. Okay, so this is uh, called expanded focus area and you can generally adjust that. That can come in handy. Lack of sharpness. Oh, it's been not my nemesis for years, okay? can be camera shake. I already mentioned that earlier, I'll mention it again. Associated with an up and down motion associated with releasing the shutter. Okay, uh, I've got big clunky hands and I'm kind of a, I, I suffer from a condition called ADHD, uh, which, uh, and I wasn't diagnosed till I was in my fifties, which makes me kind of uh, spastic. I'm sorry, that's a bad term, kind of erratic sometimes. So uh, I have a real problem sometimes in concentrating uh, on squeezing the shutter nicely. And one thing to remember, the longer the lens, the more pronounced your camera shake is. Um, so if you're shooting with a, a, a 600 millimeter lens, that camera sh shake is really going to be pronounced. For example, take a look at this duck. That is not sharp at all, okay? Let's see. Now, if you look at the difference between you, this, these two is interesting to notice. Okay, the upper picture of a ring neck duck, it's a female, I believe, is that is camera shake, okay? If you look at the one on the bottom, okay, is that's a small bird. And if you'll notice the leaves are all in focus and everything, that's not a problem with camera shake. That is a problem with poor focusing. What happened is the camera obviously focus, focused on the leaves behind the bird in that small branch. That's something you would have to address at the time. 
The image above can be prevented with uh, a faster shutter speed, using a tripod, using a monopod, bracing yourself against uh, uh, a tree, uh, a wall or something, okay? So lack of sharpness overall generally means it's camera shape, but uh, sharp focus just behind or in front of the image, the bird, is generally poor focusing. Now let's see, how do you create birding images? We're gonna take a break in just a second. Here's my eagle owl again, okay? What I do is I take a look at my images and I usually like to leave plenty of, plenty of my room, plenty of room, excuse me, in my uh, image. Uh, so when I shoot, I generally shoot uh, with the bird in the middle of the uh, screen or the uh, viewfinder. Uh, some people uh, are much more sophisticated than I am in that context. Uh, also, it helps me prevent uh, cutting wings off. For example, like in the bottom slide, I cut the edge of the wing off of the eagle owl. That freaks me out and makes me crazy, okay? So you need to leave enough room in your uh, viewfinder uh, and image for uh, the wings, especially, okay? So uh, uh, image number one, top left is not bad. Image number two is not bad. Actually, I would have loved to have the uh, background even less in focus, okay? But the image on the bottom is, Pretty good image. Uh, it it uh, it shows just before the eagle lands on the lady's glove, but I cut off the wings. Also, I probably should have gotten away with a shallower, with a lower uh, f stop, to to make a shallower depth of field. Okay, so look at your images. That's why shooting, uh, you know, rapid fire three to five can help with making uh, uh, creating. Uh, uh, images. Okay. Uh, what do we do here? Must have hit too hard here. Okay. Oh, you gotta love this. I know I do. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, that I'm sorry is a timed out slide. That, by the way, was a um, uh, Harris's hawk, uh, and it was uh, in pretty flat light. Uh, let me see if I can get back with it again. We'll look at it on uh, the screen just because it, it's going to automatically change on its own. Uh, if you take a look at the bird, uh, it's well lit. Uh, this was a cloudy day. So actually, uh, there's no shadows, which uh, makes the image much nicer. Now, it'd been nice to have the bird's head in, but I liked the, the, uh, the tail. I liked the wings. I liked the color. I like it's not quite landed yet, OK? And this would be classified as great light. Uh, great light also involves what's called the golden hour. Okay, uh, so it means that uh, it's early in the morning before sunrise and uh, later in the afternoon or evening, which involves um, sunset. And it uh, tends to give a better uh, lighting situation. Okay. Now, approaching birds slowly to, to take a safe shot. <coughs> birds tend to be skittish, uh, some more than others. For example, there's a nice little bird that I see on a golf course when I, uh, retired golf course now, when I walk, it's called a uh, vermilion flycatcher. It's very skittish. So when I see one, I take out, I walk with my bridge camera and I shoot it from a distance. Some birds you can get closer, okay? I suggest like wanting to shoot raptors, 
that you shoot the bird when you first see it. Take a couple of steps, shoot it again, a couple more steps. Keep doing that until the when you take two more steps and it flies away, okay, be ready to shoot. The point I'm trying to make is that you want to make sure you get at least one shot. So you can't afford to wait till you get up close and the minute you bring your camera to your eye, it's going to fly away and you get nothing, okay? So again, approach slowly, okay? Take a safe shot, continue, and reach your ideal distance and then get the best shot you can. Why don't we take a break right now? I'm gonna give you about five minutes, okay? If you got any questions, put them on chat and we'll start back. I've got, uh, let's see, about 11.07. How about uh, come back at about, uh, how about we'll say uh, 11.15, is that okay? All right, see you then. Oh, Maynard, you getting anything? You're muted, remember? Hello, Mike. How you doing, buddy? I'm all right. Hey, I, I'm getting a lot out of this. Uh, I was just fixing to type a question, but I wouldn't ask you. Sure. S SD cards or XQD cards? Okay. I'm sorry. I couldn't think of that SD card. I remember I couldn't win a couldn't think of SD card. SD card and SDQ card. A lot of it has to do with uh, the speed of the cards, and that's megabits per second. Okay, um, they'll have pro on them or extreme or something like that. Um, generally, did you what camera did you purchase, Maynard? I've got the uh, Nikon 500, so it has an SQD card and an SD card in it. Okay, uh, what's the difference between the XQD and the SD card? Uh, size of the card, and I think the speed of the card. Okay. Okay. The, XQ, the XQD is very, very fast, and then okay. the SD I use for like a backup card. Sure. I've got like in my uh, Sony, I've got a two SD card slot, uh, and one will uh, uh, write to that card at 300 megabits a second. The other card only writes at like 170. So I use the second uh, SD card as a backup. Do you use your second as a backup or as an overflow? Well, actually it, it's it's basically the same thing. It, okay. it takes over as overflow, but there's certain information written on it that the camera puts there for some reason. Mm -hmm. So I use my, and I use a, I believe it's 128 uh, gigabyte, uh, 300 uh, megabits per second Sony card. So uh -huh. um, I, uh, uh, I use that in the camera sometimes, uh, one time I forgot and switched to the slower card and I couldn't figure out why it was running so slow. So Would there be any advantage if I go uh, shoot in raw because my, the SQD card handles that real well, yeah. then how would I basically send it to you unless I use the second card as the... Um, JPEG card. Well, actually, uh, you can send it to me because uh, I can read wrong. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, and how do you how do you load? Uh, have you loaded images on your computer yet? Uh, I've got a few from a couple of trips here a year oh, okay. or so back. Okay. That I'd I'd like to share with you. I have not been able to go out since I talked to you last and get yeah. some more. Oh, okay. Okay, and when you load them on on your uh, computer, do you use um, do you use a card reader, or do you do it directly from the camera? Uh, car. I was always told to use a card reader, absolutely. which is better. Of course. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's the way to go. Uh, was there another question? No, I, I'm doing great. I'm really loving the class. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm I'm sorry about the uh, the glitches, but uh, <laughs> there ain't no glitches. All right, Mayor. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Hey, Mike. Bye. This is 
This is yes. Kirk. I just want to give you yeah, my point. You know, I, I came up with that same issue of running into the buffer. Yes. And, and so I used my Canon ADD and just did a test one time. And I think I could get like 18 pictures before it hit the buffer. Yeah. So trying to do like the super fast with the birds. Okay. So I, then I went to the 300 megabyte per second and then ran another test and it, it is fast enough that it never hits the buffer speed. Okay. And so the key that's to, a big advantage, you're right. Yeah, the key to, uh, is one thing that, that um, a lot of people don't realize is um, uh, these are sophisticated pieces of equipment and they have certain capabilities. So uh, when you buy a camera, before you buy a memory card, see how fast a memory card it can use. Because to get, for example, my Sony will write it about 300 megabits a second to a card. If I put in a 95 megabits per second, I've negated uh, half of the value, and probably yeah, more than half of the value of the camera. You're limiting your camera's capability then. Oh, sure. So, so the thing is, it's not a simple case anymore of, yeah, I'll go grab this and I'll get this. and. And uh, I found people at Best Buy and in other kinds of things when it comes to knowing cameras, also for computers, by the way, um, they don't know their butt from a hole in the ground. Uh, it's oftentimes uh, great to talk to somebody who's been doing it a long time, okay, and uh, uh, is willing to share an opinion and clarify a fact. It's an opinion. Uh, some people like, I don't say Sony's the best. I don't say Canon's the best. What I tell people is I use this for these reasons, okay? It may work for you, it may not. So the key I think is, uh, is uh, learning the capabilities of your camera. And that's one reason why I suggest to anybody uh, that when they start out, okay, um, uh, start, using auto, okay? So make sure you have the equipment that will do what you wanna do, okay? And then um, start using it, okay? And uh, I don't discourage people from using auto when they first start out, because there's too much stuff going on. I mean, you get out shooting birds, I'm, uh, it can get kind of hairy sometimes, you know? So, uh, but yeah, that's an interesting point that when you yeah, find you out you made Perhaps. another good point there is that I don't know what my camera capability is. So maybe it's not doing 300. I, I guess I need to check my uh, brochure on the camera and find out what the max uh, SD card it can take. So, but it's working, working better with the high speed. You know, if I over, overspend on the card, I'm still happy. Yeah, the, the thing you can do, Kurt, is like I said, Google's your friend is get on Google, put in your camera, what, say whatever it's, it's technical specs or say, how fast will this camera write to a memory card? And be that specific. And it'll give you a ton of articles. It might give you a YouTube video or something like that. Yeah, so thanks. I still say Google's a friend. And oftentimes when you go to a camera manual, uh, you either end up catatonic, catatonic <laughs> or pulling your hair out. Always hard to get through. Oh God, yes, absolutely. Okay, it's about time to get started. So uh, I'll talk to, I'll be around after the, the uh, lecture's over if there's any questions then too. Okay, so I'm gonna get set up again. Uh, thanks for the questions, Kirk Maynard. Okay. You're welcome, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you in a while. Okay. Hopefully, everybody's back. Uh, Onward and upward, and I'll try to keep the glitches to a minimum. I'm going to review that last slide again. Uh, again, approach the bird slowly, all right? And uh, move slowly. Don't walk at a normal pace. Walk very slowly. I'm serious, okay? 
and don't scare the birds. And another thing that's a real pet peeve with me is when you are in a group, a birding group or a bird photography group, and you walk right in front of somebody, okay, even if it's just with binoculars or with a camera, that's rude, okay? It's very rude. Also, if you got a limited space area, please consider others. Take your shot, get a few shots, but don't hog the area all the time. Let other people get in there, okay? Uh, a lot of these things you think is common sense, but uh, unfortunately it's not. So pay attention to people around you, uh, pay attention, look behind you. Uh, and uh, if, for example, you cut in front of somebody or you uh, disturb a shot, uh, I generally apologize. All right, onward and upward now. Know your birds and their behavior. For example, study the species behaviors. Okay, you can do it. Uh, field guides will help. Uh, bird books will help. Uh, there's all kinds of books out there. I must have at least five to six different uh, um, field guides or birding books. Uh, matter of fact, I have a, one on my phone I use all the time, and we'll talk about those kinds of things in a minute. So here, for example, this is a gray hawk. This was shot at uh, Desert Museum with the Raptor Free Flight, okay? Uh, and if you can guess what the bird's about to do, the bird is about to take off, fly. Um, interesting thing is, is an indication that a bird is gonna fly, especially a raptor or a larger bird, they poop first. Uh, sometimes if you time it right, you can catch the poop as it expels in midair. Uh, I'm not encouraging that, uh, but that's one quick indication. This bird ain't gonna sit there very long. They're gonna move. So uh, know those types of things. Know if they're in a crouch position they'll generally look around, okay? Have the, the camera up to your eye and be ready to shoot. <clears throat> also, learn nesting behaviors. For example, the little bird I've mentioned before, the uh, verdant, the verdant builds a nest that it enters from the bottom, okay? Most birds enter from the top, but the verdant enters from the bottom. Notice feeding hand. Okay, I have bird feeders, uh, a bunch of them out in my patio area here at my condo. Okay, I put out mealyworms. Why? Because many birds eat protein, mealyworms. Okay, uh, cactus wrens, for example. Uh, Curbbill thrashers will do it. Uh, so uh, that helps in attracting birds. Know their mating habits. Okay, um, I was out taking a walk yesterday on. Uh, uh, Kanoa Hills uh, Trails Park. And uh, I knew the uh, house finches were, uh, were ready to mate, ready to mate, flying around, chasing each other. Also, the male birds tend to be extremely colorful at this time, okay? Uh, generally during the winter, they go through something called the molt, where they are not real attractive. The, the, car, uh, the colors are duller. Uh, but during mating season, that's when they get extremely colorful. Uh, that oftentimes uh, is, uh, coincides pretty much with uh, migration. Uh, there's a big uh, migration of warblers that goes up through the Great Lakes. And uh, I've been fortunate to go to a place in Ohio called McGee Marsh that is right on Lake Erie, which is a flyway for warblers and caught I shot probably a couple of thousand pictures of warblers there, okay? So uh, know also the migration behaviors. Watch when they come uh, around Green Valley. I spent six months in Michigan, six months here, so I kind of pay attention to when I start seeing things like gamble quails out moving around, okay? The um, greyhawk, okay? It doesn't wear here, so, okay. Let's see, flycatchers, uh, they have a feeding behavior. This is a vermilion flycatcher. Uh, it's flying out from a branch, okay? And it's going out to catch bugs in midair. Okay, what it does is it comes right back to the same branch again. You'll see that frequently with uh, flycatchers, vermilion flycatcher. Uh, another is called a Says Phoebe. 
or a black Phoebe. Uh, those are all fly catchers. They fly out, grab a bug and come back. So that's called fly catcher behavior. Also, that's a way you can plan. If you know they're coming back to the same branch, set up the shoot, the picture, uh, focus in on the branch and be ready when they land, okay? Same thing is kind of try to anticipate when, when they're going to take off, but that's fly catcher behavior, okay? Other behaviors, uh, the one on the left is a turn. The turn actually, along with kingfishers, will kind of hover over the water because they're both dive in the water to get fish or others, okay? Uh, and the thing is, you can oftentimes anticipate where the bird's going to hit the water. And the ideal shot is if you can catch the bird hitting the water. By the way, the only way you can do that, unless you're extremely lucky, is use a extremely fast shutter speed, okay? Um, so uh, know the bird's behavior, okay? Where they nest, where they like to, where they like to uh, sit, okay? Where they like to perch, rather, okay? So other things, how about, uh, this is a uh, uh, image of a phrygianus hawk, the largest hawk in the United States, uh, beautiful bird. Uh, this is not the best uh, picture image in the world. Uh, the shadow from the cactus is blocking pretty much uh, the front part of the wings and also the face. So I would, you know, and, and a lot of these were shot in the last couple of years. Okay. Here, this is a landing. This is a barn owl. Again, both of these were shot at the Desert Museum. Okay. It's always, uh, sometimes the best image, not always, but the best image is catching the bird kind of at the peak of the action. Well, the peak of the action at takeoff is once they've left the branch. The peak of the action landing is when they are about to land on the branch. If you catch it when it's already on the branch, it's too late. If you catch them before they leave, it's too early. So the idea is to show that they're in midair. So it takes practice, okay? I used to go, when they were doing a rapid free flight, I used to go almost once a week to the Desert Museum. I'm a member to shoot it. And my wife would say, why do you keep going? Same birds, same activity. You get different shots all the time. And I'm looking for something called the V shot. Okay, how about isolating the bird from the background? <clears throat> for example, perching in thick branches. Uh, this is a sparrow and off the top of my head, I can't tell you what it is. Uh, problem with this is, is it's pretty much the color of the branches and the bird is kind of small. So uh, also it's pretty cluttered. So it's not really the best shot possible, okay? Uh, it shows your behavior. You can see the two bird. Uh, matter of fact, the interesting thing is I didn't notice the bird on the bottom until I took a longer look at it. So my eye was automatically drawn to the bird in the center. Also, it tends to be sharper and also a bit more colorful. Remember that songbirds such as um, house finches, uh, goldfinches, uh, lesser goldfinches are what we get out here. Also, you get the Lawrence's goldfinch. They uh, flip from branch to branch and branch to tree or tree to tree, okay? So uh, be aware of that. So again, Rapid uh, uh, three to five shots per second might help you capture the bird uh, in flight. Uh, try to capture a shot with a clean background. Uh, trust me, the image on the right is not a clean background. That would not be an excellent example of your photo work, okay? It's a great example of what not to do. And select a wide aperture for shallow depth of field. What does that mean? We need a really fast uh, aperture, which means wide open, which means your depth of field is narrow. Uh, that oftentimes will help with uh, blurring the background. You'll see some examples in a minute.
Busy versus blurred background. This is a Vermilion flycatcher and the background is absolutely lovely, okay? That is a chain link fence. Uh, that is not the best image. I caught the bird in flight, yeah, okay. But beyond that, it's terrible, well, excuse me. Beyond that, it's a terrible, okay? So what I try to do is I do this. I blurred the background, okay? Um, and this, by the way, is a Vermilion flycatcher. It may be a female or it could be a juvenile. I'm not an expert by any means. Notice the background. Also, I probably could have taken out the uh, wire or the white thing behind him with a little work in uh, Lightroom, but uh, uh, I didn't do it. So, uh, both pictures catch the bird in flight. The one on the right actually is sharper, okay, and demonstrates uh, better action in the background is much better. So uh, usually you don't want a busy black background. You want a blurred background. Now the position, notice the bird. This was a red-tailed hawk I shot a couple of weeks ago uh, near the Ina Road Bridge. Uh, notice the stick. <clears throat> going right through the bird's eye. Not the best picture. Now, what did I do? I took about one or two steps to the left, reshot the image. The branch is still there, but it's not distracting. It doesn't destroy the image. It'd be great if I could have gotten in a position to remove the branch, but the way the branch had grown and the way it was positioned it would be extremely difficult to get the bird without the branch in the image. Focus on the bird's eye, okay? Uh, it's key to creating a stunning photographs of the birds, okay? Uh, if you focus on the eye, it draws the viewer into the picture or image. Um, and you wanna shoot with the sun behind you if at all possible, okay? Because what it does is it call, causes something called catch light. This is called an eared grebe. This was on the Kanoa Hills Pond uh, across I-19 from us in here in Green Valley. If you live on the west side, notice the beautiful red eye. And unfortunately, I don't think there's a good catch light there, but I think it's a pretty adequate image and the eye sticks out big time, okay? So again, focus on the eye. Focus uh, on the eye will draw the viewer in and shoot with the sun behind you, which uh, frequently will result in uh, a catch light. Okay, know what's going on around you. Well, we're gonna do this one more time. I love doing this. I get, I get so excited when this shows. Okay, what's going on around you? Well, let's see, prepare for the unexpected. Always be ready, okay? Uh, matter of fact, probably the best time to, to get ready is, is before you go out and shoot. First thing you need to do is check your F-stop, check your shutter speed, check your how your ISO is, is it set or is it floating? Uh, so get prepared, so be ready, okay? But always have your camera at ready, okay? <clears throat> Keep both eyes open when focusing. I'm still working on this. I've been in photography, I started shooting pictures in 1968 and I still have trouble doing this, keeping both eyes open when focusing. I'll get it one of these days, okay? Listen to or for no noises indicating something is happening. Um, Oftentimes, uh, it's interesting, I sit in my uh, recliner and right next to the window are uh, hummingbird feeders. And I know exactly when the hummingbirds are there because of the sound of their wings, okay? Uh, so pay attention to sounds, okay? Sounds can be extremely important. Uh, trying to locate the bird by sounds is extremely difficult sometimes and take your eye off the viewfinder on occasionally to look around. Uh, try not to do it when the bird is about to take off, okay? And don't take it off for a long period of time, all right? Now, create some interesting compositions. Try to take bird pictures from their perspective. 
which means get down low. Uh, ducks should be at ground level. Uh, I usually don't do that too often because um, when I lay down on my belly, uh, unless there's somebody there to assist me, I have a hell of a time getting up. So, uh, and uh, I think I'm gonna start carrying a, uh, a tarp or something like that or a big towel to lay on the ground. Um, also uh, down at ground level, the burst level oftentimes uh, allows you to blur the background better, okay? Also, give the bird room in the frame. Notice the roadrunner's running, okay? Ideally, it probably shouldn't have cropped it so tight. I should have allowed a little more room to the left. But remember, you wanna give an image that's flying, walking, running. You need to give the image, uh, the uh, a bird in the image, room to move, okay? If I cropped it along, let's say a half an inch or something from the bird's beak, that would be an uncomfortable feeling. There's no room for the bird to go. You're afraid it's gonna hit the edge of the edge of the, um, the image. So it probably sounds silly, but you'll understand what I mean when you start working, okay? Also, this one is a ruddy duck, a male, in what's called breeding, a beautiful blue bill, uh, kind of a, uh, a burgundy and brownish um, feathers on the back. Um, and the um, reflection is kind of cool. Why did I shoot? Some people would say, well, that's kind of cluttered. Why'd you do this? Well, it demonstrates this tells a story about the ruddy duck, where they're found. They're found oftentimes in the reeds, okay? They're what's called uh, diving ducks. So they, they will actually go underwater to feed, okay? There's other kinds of ducks that are called dabblers that don't die, okay? So in my estimation, not everyone will agree. This is a relatively good image. The image is tack sharp, the colors are good, uh, and it's somewhat interesting, okay? But again, somebody else might do it different, which is fine, that's good, okay? Now, look for great light, the best light, sunrise. I don't do sunrise. Unfortunately, I'm gonna try starting that very soon, but I don't do sunrise. I'm not an early riser. I go to bed late at night. I need to stop that. I need to get out there and get up with the birds and such, because that's where you get the best light. This, for example, is sunrise. <clears throat> this, I believe, is a great egret. I, I must be honest, I did not take this picture, okay? I was probably sleeping when this picture was taken, okay? I didn't take it, but I wanted to find a good example of uh, the golden hour, it's called, uh, in the morning. So I used somebody else's picture, okay? Uh, I will not take credit for somebody else's work, okay? Uh, also, sunsets, another one. This is a sunset. This is, uh, I'm not sure what it is, okay? Um, I should be able to tell from the silhouette, but I can't. Uh, also, sunsets are excellent for silhouettes. Sunrises are good from, for, uh, for example, with the egret, the light coming through the feathers, okay? Kind of a halo effect. Uh, very soft, very warm, very comforting, okay? And the um, reflection adds to it. So look for great light uh, la later in the afternoon before sunrise, okay? and work with it. But remember, the light is gonna be lower, so you're gonna to have to make adjustments to shutter speed and to f-stop. Visit a location frequently. I go to the pond a lot, okay? I go other places too. Why did I include this? Because this is a picture of where I go frequently, okay? This is looking south uh, on the pond, all right? Uh, and that, uh, Usually, uh, earlier in the year, I would see a lot of um, oh, uh, pintail ducks, beautiful duck, brown, white, black. Uh, it's a dabbler, and they will usually put butts up in unison oftentimes. I've got pictures of four or five ducks with their butts up. Okay, these uh, tend to be uh, uh, pintail ducks, okay? So you get comfortable with 
what you're going to see, where you're going to see it, and when you're going to see it. Okay, you know where to sit. And oftentimes it's best to sit and wait. Let the birds and the ducks and stuff come to you. Capture bird behavior. For example, nesting. This was shot at the uh, Desert Museum. Uh, not the best image. Uh, part of the bill is cut off, uh, but it's a relatively sharp image. Uh, uh, I can do better and I should do better. Uh, this one, I kind of like. This was shot up in a place called Ash Canyon, which is outside of, um, oh God, where Fort Huachuca is, I, uh, Sierra Vista, there we go. Uh, these brain farts are driving me nuts. Uh, I thought this was kind of interesting because this is a, a Bullock's Oreo uh, eating an orange and also eating a honeybee, okay? Uh, so he's getting his uh, fruit and his meat at the same time. So know the behavior, know what to expect. We, um, we feed Baltimore Orioles back home in Michigan and we put grape jelly out for them. And last year was a great year for uh, Orioles. Um, Mary, uh, my wife, Mary always says, I say the cookie and not the bird, but uh, we saw a whole family of Baltimore Orioles uh, come to our feeders uh, and it was quite interesting. <clears throat> Also, get creative. Okay, this one is not the best shot. I'm not real wild about the fact it's on a bird feeder and stuff like this, but uh, it shows a bird tack sharpen and focus. And I think that's a uh, black throat, but I could be wrong. I'm certainly not a bird expert yet. Uh, this is a um, broad bill hummingbird. That's all. Uh, fuzzy and out of focus. How do I know that? Because of the red bill. Okay, so that's a bit creative. It's different. It's not a great shot, but it's adequate. This I like much better. This is a Fena Pepla. Okay, um, it tends to be tack sharp with the foreground and the background blurred. And the eye is a bit covered, but from my artistic standpoint, I like it. Does anybody else? I don't know, okay? If they don't, that's fine. If they do, that's fine too. And remember, art is in the eyes of the beholder, okay? Uh, technically, it's, it's good because of uh, the sharp focus, okay? But be creative, do something different, okay? Panning, it follows the bird and blurs the background. Oftentimes you would use slower shutter speeds. Instead of maybe one four thousandth of a second, you might go to one fifteen hundredths of a second, uh, depending, and you have to practice and see what, what works. Uh, and it helps create a sense of movement. Uh, the key is keeping the bird in focus. Take for example, this is by the way, this is a um, Northern Harrier, okay, which uh, is a, a hawk we have here in Arizona. Uh, and if you saw the face, the face looks something like an owl. Uh, to me, it's real easy to identify because of its face. Also, the fact it tends to fly lower, okay, uh, and has a very, again, distinct face and um, coloring. Okay, so panning. Notice the background's blurry as hell, and yet the bird is in that focus. Uh, actually, if I was experimenting a little bit, I would slow the shutter speed down just a tad more so I would catch the wings slightly blurred, okay? Have fun. Ducks, geese, cranes, and herons are excellent to practice on. They're big. Setting up feeders and a bird bath at your home can be extremely helpful. Uh, I'm gonna show you some pictures in a minute of uh, shots I made just here out on my uh, small patio in Arizona, okay? Bird photography is rewarding, addictive, and a lot of fun. I've gotta tell you, it can be very, very frustrating also, uh, but learn from it. The key is studying your images afterwards. No, and one thing you might wanna jot down is what the weather conditions were like that day. Was it windy? Was it sunny? Was it overcast? Did it rain? So on and so forth, and then look at the what's called metadata when you get into um, uh, putting your pictures on computer 
uh, I might be doing a class uh, in the not too distant future about uh, organizing your photos and uh, processing your photos with, uh, with software. Uh, and I do very basic processing. I don't usually use fo um, Photoshop because uh, the learning curve to me is like climbing Mount Everest. Okay, so I use Lightroom and I, used to, uh, I will use Elements, uh, Photoshop Elements also. So uh, again, fun, but learn from it. If you don't learn, if you don't get better, you get frustrated, then you get bored, then you get tired, and then you just put the camera down and don't use it again. So uh, give yourself a reason to continue to use your camera, okay? The key is studying your images. Also a tack sharp image of a bird in flight will put out a smile on your face and just about anybody's face, okay? It's great fun. That's one thing I'm working on right now. Also, here, for example, great blue heron. I should have blurred the background a little bit more, but it shows the great blue heron in flight, eyes sharp, birds sharp, okay? Uh, but the background is just a tad busy, okay? This is a great egret. This is a little bit better. Background's pretty much blurred. Uh, and I like it because the bird's mouth is open, okay? Uh, so... You want to get uh, get away from those those um, what do you call them uh, postcard shots? Uh, not to knock postcards, but but an image that well, for example, a great blue heron image. Nothing remarkable or outstanding about it. Okay, it's a good shot in the sense it's tack sharp, but it could be a much much better picture. Okay. Also, uh, this one is a, a gull I shot uh, in uh, Michigan. <laughs> Okay, uh, again, the, uh, the wings are, uh, are frozen, okay? And I'm not looking at the metadata right now, so I can't tell you how fast the shutter speed was or anything else, but the background is relatively blurred, <coughs> excuse me, but it could be uh, more blurred, so to speak. Now, uh, thanks. I've, I've got a couple of pictures I wanna show you. The lecture, formal lecture is done. By the way, this is a flock of, if you can't tell, yellow-headed blackbirds. This was shot at Whitewater Draw, probably in January or February a couple of years ago. I think it was 19. And it was, uh, and I had tried for years to get a picture, a picture of a yellow-headed blackbird. Okay, and uh, then I got this thing, which was absolutely crazy. And hundreds and hundreds of these birds were flying around in a group. It was quite fascinating. I loved it. Now let's take a look at a couple of uh, images. These were all shot on my patio here in Green Valley. Okay, uh, not the best shot. Okay, but it's okay. Uh, it's pretty sharp. It shows an example of a uh, white crown sparrow. Okay, again, uh, one of the best place to practice with a new lens or a new camera body or something, a new tripod, is you can do it in your backyard or backyard or your patio. Like I say, extremely small patio, okay? Um, so this is a white crown sparrow. And again, these are for not, not something I'm gonna show to something other than a lecture like this to show you what you can do for practice in your area. Okay, this, believe it or not, is a house finch. It's not that sharp, uh, please forgive me. It's kind of soft. This is called, when something is not real uh, tack sharp focus, it's soft, and this is definitely soft. Interesting, um, house finches tend to be red. This one is kind of a yellowish orange. Uh, a lot of it they say has to do with diet. So you look, sometimes you'll see a little bit different image. This is an example of not a picture you want to share with people. So, okay. Here's a regular house finch. Uh, background's pretty good, pretty blurred. Uh, I could have brought up the, uh, the uh, beak and the eye a little bit more. Uh, the colors are, are interesting on the water, okay? Uh, but this, again, sitting in my uh, chair on the patio uh, and probably shot with my uh, 100, 400, or 200, 600. 
Uh, it's the same one. And this is a um, Buick's wren. Uh, runs around a little bit. Uh, loved the little thing. He's cool. And when he's uh, when he's calling, uh, uh, he can be uh, cause a lot of racket. We've got uh, uh, house wrens back home that uh, that call most of the early summer. Okay, uh, very interesting. Just a little tiny bird, uh, really sharp. I I love them, and I love to shoot pictures of them. And that is it, folks. Uh, I am done with uh, sharing my screen. Uh, so I'm going to stop to share. So if there's any questions, uh, can we fire away one at a time? Okay. Anybody? Two, two questions for you, Mike. Yes, ma'am. I don't see anybody else jumping in. Anyway, one, you recommended the gimbal head over a ball head. Yes. Um, is there one in particular that you uh, recommend? Doesn't the ball pan as well, or what's yeah, the Yeah, the problem is, is, is the the ball when you loosen it is very. Uh, thing about a gimbal head is when you properly set it and adjust it, it will stay in position. If you aim, set it up like this, it'll stay there. If you set it down like this, it'll stay there. So what it does is it's balanced, so it's ready to shoot where you can't leave the ball head loosened because it will flop the camera, whatever. So when you when you have a ball head, you need to lock the ball head when you take your hand off the camera. The other question real quick then, on the focus point, you was talking about multiple focus points when mm -hmm. they're in flight. Yeah. How do you uh, then focus on the eye if they're in flight? That's that can be a problem. Okay. Uh, generally, I try to get the eye in the center focus point. You've got a center focus point that is the most sensitive, but you other have other focus points that will also um, uh, um, focus. So uh, you've got two different types of focusing, and I don't want to get into that right now, but it allows you to you can put that center point on the eye. That's what I try to do. A lot of times with smaller birds or fast moving birds, uh, you can't do it. So it's an ideal, okay? Thank you very, very much. I appreciate the class and you have a great day. You Good too, class, Mike. Yeah, Jim. Good class. Thank right. you. Yeah. What is your bridge camera? My bridge camera is a... Uh, as a Sony uh, RX104, and I'm looking. They say the RX105 may came out this year. I'm kind of a, uh, uh, a gear geek, so uh, depending on what they do to it, I may I may sell this one and get that one. I don't know yet. So that's the bridge camera I use. I've tried the uh, the Nikon. Uh, the Sony has a larger um, sensor than most of the others. Uh, Jim, matter of fact, used a Nikon 950, <laughs> but, uh, and I know a couple of people used a P1000, um, but the problem with those is sensor tends to be extremely small. Matter of fact, uh, the research I did, it's about the size of a, um, um, a cell phone. Okay. So, um, and again, sensor size uh, runs into issues as far as, is. uh, uh, enlarging an image and so on and so forth. Okay. That answer you. your question. Yes. Okay. Next, anybody? Uh, Nobody else? Mike Day yes. here. Yes, Mike. Have you, uh, have you worked much with blinds? Uh, no, actually, uh, I did work with a blind once. There's a place here in Arizona called Wow, W O W, Arizona. And it's up north of Marana. This guy has, has several acres. I don't know how many. He's got bird feeders all over the place. He also has a blind. And I was sitting in the blind and I had my uh, camera on a tripod and I was shooting. Uh, he's got a, a hose that's uh, showering water on, on an area. And, and uh, uh, I was shooting uh, uh, cardinals and so on and so forth, curb bill thrashers and stuff. And I had my camera on a tripod and what comes walking by but a bobcat. Couldn't have been any more than three feet away from me. He wow. looked at me in the blind. I looked at him. 
I didn't have my camera. I couldn't get it off fast enough. I didn't have a spare camera with me. So I just enjoyed uh, doing, um, uh, watching the bobcat and enjoying the nature. But I've considered getting a single person blind uh, to use. Because uh, I found oftentimes sitting in one place, uh, oftentimes without a blind, if you just sit still and relax, birds come back. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I've considered a blind. I may, I may go ahead and get a single person blind. We'll have to see. Did I answer your question? Yes. Uh, second question. Yes, sir. Uh, I find that I end up doing a lot of cropping. And yes. uh, so a, a really large number of pixels as a starting point gives me some hope that I'll get a picture at the end yes. of cropping. Um, I think I have 36 megapixels on my DLSR. Okay. But there are ones out there now that have 45. Yes. Doesn't sound like it would be that big an improvement, but what would you, what would you think? Well, uh, generally, um, uh, I generally, uh, I, I've never been a real pixel freak, but I'm, I'm starting to change my mind a bit. Um, uh, generally, I've tried to improve the size of the image by going with larger glass, but I'm, I have a 200-600 uh, plus a 100-400, both of them Sony, and I have a 1.4 and a 2.0 extender. Both are Sony's. Okay, I try to do that now. Uh, Oftentimes, the cameras with extremely large, I, I think there's a, a, seven, a, a Sony 7R4 or something has 42 megapixels or, or three and something like that. Well, that actually uh, uh, is like adding distance. You, so the, the image occupies more pixels. So there's two ways of addressing it. What I think you have to get into is... Um, uh, if I have an option to go to, for example, I've got a, a 92 I bought two years ago. Uh, I thought about the, the, uh, the A1, I guess it is, the, the, the new Sony. Uh, it's got 60 megapixels, okay? Um, but I don't know if I want to pay 6,500 bucks for a body right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's six and one half does the other. Uh, what are you shooting right now with camera? Uh, Nikon D810. Oh, D810. Okay. Um, what's your longest lens? I generally use my 300. 300. Okay. Uh, have you used, is it a, a, a Nikon 300 or is it a, uh, off-brand? I have two different Nikon 300s. One's a prime lens, one's a, a zoom lens. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, have you tried a uh, Nikon doubler or, uh, an X14 extender? I had a, a doubler and I tried using it and I just didn't like the quality of the image. Okay. But, uh, maybe that's, maybe I should have not bought a more expensive doubler or something. I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, did you buy a Nikon extender? Well, I have a friend who does use equipment and he gave me one that was probably not a Nikon extender. Okay. Then what I would suggest if you're spent a lot of money on glass and stuff, uh, both of my extenders, the 1.4 and the 2, were over $500, okay? Um, but it beats the hell out of a price of a 800 mil or a 600 mil yeah. F4. Yeah. So I think it's, it's uh, <clears throat> you might want to try a Nikon extender. What, what's, uh, how fast is your 300 mil, your prime? Um, let's see, I'm trying to re remember now. Um, F4, F5, 6? I think it's an F4. Okay. Let me look at it. <laughs> okay. No, can't find it. <laughs> um, I, the uh, the uh, zoom is uh, F5, 6 down to about something smaller, uh, something larger. I don't know. F4 to F5.7. Uh, okay. Like okay. So it's, it's, uh, it probably wasn't wasn't you didn't have to mortgage your home to get it. So no, no. Um, uh, I I think uh, unless you're in the market for a new camera, you know you might want to uh, use the equipment you got and go with a uh, a. Uh, I try one four first and see if you're okay. comfortable with that. 
Okay. All right. All right. Next question. Anybody? Yeah. Hey, Mike. Uh, Tom Parker. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks for this because I try and learn something new every day. And I think uh, we're good for about the next month and a half. Oh, okay. <laughs> but a uh, real excellent presentation. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is bridge cameras for, yes. particularly for, for wildlife. And, and you mentioned the sensor limitations. Uh -huh. uh, what are some of the other things we should be paying attention to when it comes to uh, uh, bridge cameras and, and bird photography? Well, uh, the thing is, I researched them before I bought one, okay? And I had looked at the P900. Matter of fact, I had one for a week or two and then sent it back to Amazon. Uh, it tended to be heavy. Um, and again, with my issue with, with camera shape, uh, it, it was a problem. So the P950 to P9 1000 tend to be very heavy. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, that is probably a limitation there unless you plan to use a tripod all the time. Um, but their, their focal lengths are, are bizarre. I mean, uh, the P1000 has a 3000 millimeter focal length. And Jim, one of the people that attends my SIG all the time, uh, used a 950. So he can, he can vouch for that. The P900 and 950 were 2000 millimeter. Yeah. Uh, but again, you start running into issues again of handholding. Okay. Uh, the best rated uh, bridge camera of all of them has been the Sony RX10 IV. Um, it's, uh, it's better. I started with the Panasonic uh, bridge camera back in 2007. They've come a long way since. But uh, I would recommend the RX10 IV, and I would wait until the 10.5 should be uh, coming out soon, which could be an advantage for two reasons. Not necessarily that you need to buy the 10.5, but the 10.4 should be curse of price. 10.4 runs about $1,500. So most bridge cameras uh, generally are around 1,000 to possibly 1,200. You can get them cheaper than that. Um, I paid 800 bucks for mine, yeah. How much? 800 bucks for the 950. Yeah, um, but uh, uh, as far as um, quality of images, uh, they're outstanding quality um, from the RX-10. I've seen people who, one of the people, I do a bird SIG on Wednesday afternoons uh, and on Zoom and there's a guy with an RX-10-4 that does outstanding stuff. The quality is excellent, yeah. okay? So um, I would think, uh, I would research again on your own, uh, check it out and, um, uh, and when did you plan to pull the trigger on this by the way? Pretty soon because uh, we're, we're big bird lovers and everything, and uh, we've got tons of them in our backyard. We're oh, hell yeah. Them. Okay. And so, uh, and, and we're doing our thing, uh, you know, attracting birds in and all. And oh, sure. Uh, yeah. It's just, there's so many opportunities just in our own backyard, just like oh, we yeah. were talking about on your patio. Uh, where are you located? Are you in Green Valley? We're on uh, Desert Creek. Oh, uh, okay. Just off, just off of Duval Mine Road. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, you're on uh, which side of uh, 19? East or west? The, uh, west side. West side. Okay. See, I'm in Desert Hills 4. Um, uh, about, when I say uh, not far from the, uh, the Presbyterian Church, a lot of people know where I'm talking about. The oh, yeah. So yeah, we, we, uh, we have a very small condo there. But if you're, if you're ready, check it out. Uh, and we'll, is this your wife, by the way? Yes, it hi. is. Yeah, uh, hi there. How you doing? Uh, will both of you be using it? Yeah, we'll be fighting over it. Okay. Um, I, got uh, my, I have my P950 for sale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I have further advice, by the way. Um, I would suggest, uh, uh, and I, I'm going to sound terribly sexist here, and I don't want to. It, it tends to be the Nikons tend to be extremely heavy, especially the P1000, okay? Uh, and I think you'll be happy with the weight. The, um, the RX-10-4 uh, is a 24 to 600. So uh, in, in your backyard, that kind of thing, I think it might be, uh, uh, might be the way to go. Uh, do you have further questions on that? No, appreciate that, Mike. 
Okay. Um, and and I would uh, again, I have no. I, I'm I've been pleased with Sony. Uh, so uh, what you might want to do is buy the RX 104. Now I would recommend it over the three. Okay, or the two. Um, generally, uh, if if you're at all serious about you know uh, shooting pictures, like I've been known to shoot uh, 1,500 to 2,000 in a day. So uh, you probably want to go with the RX-10 IV. Then if the 5 comes out and you got the money, what the heck? You know, I give my wife my old equipment, see? So you might want to buy it for your wife, the RX-10 V. See, down the road, Pete. Yeah, her birthday's coming up this week. And, uh, <laughs> you know, she's getting the next COVID shot today, second COVID shot today. So I'm yeah. going to do something special for her. So. Yeah, we, we, got, we got our second COVID last, uh, last Monday. I'm curious, did... Uh, uh, it didn't bother me the day of it. Were you kind of uh, punky the second day? No. Really interesting, because my wife and I have no reaction no. at all. I've, I've, I've had, um, I know a couple of friends of mine that, that did. Um, yeah. I I think I was extremely lucky because because um, most people I know of um, who have had had their first and second. Yeah. Had, um, just a, a, an overall lethargy the second day. The, yeah, the, day. the um, yeah, I was I was kind of punky, and so was my wife the second day, and then she didn't feel too well the the uh, third day. I mean the the uh, uh, I mean the day after the shot, I felt really bad. The the day after that, I felt oh, I had a mild headache. See, I do my bird sig on Wednesday, so I was able to do that without a problem. So, um, by the way, have you attended my bird sig at all? No, but uh, we're going to add that on to our punch list. Oh, okay. It's uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, <clears throat> it's done on Zoom. And uh, people uh, get together and share images. We usually ask people to share about five images. And uh, we go over them. I don't get critical or anything like that. I had one lady visit the SIG one time who thought I was terrible because I, 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 you know, was critical to a lady. And, and I'm wasn't being critical. I, we were just discussing it because a lot of people come to learn, you know, what yeah. can I do to make this better? Or I'll ask, what do you think you could do to make it better? So I try to make it a teaching experience also. But uh, yeah, check it out and just go to the kiosk where you signed up for this class and uh, you should be able to uh, sign up for it and love to see you. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Great. Nice talking to you. Thanks for coming. I hope you got something out of it. Bye-bye now. Oh. A lot. Okay, good. Any other questions? I was kind of icky the second day, Mike. Yes. Yeah. Shot. My wife yeah. too. My wife had a she had a couple of days. She had a little bit achy and little uh, yeah. Yeah. tired feeling and and other stuff. Yeah, it lasts a little longer with my wife, but not so much me. Did you have a question, uh, Trace? No, no, I just wanted to say that and I, how much I enjoyed this. This is the second time I've seen it and I always learn something. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sorry about the glitches. Those drive me, oh, but they make happy. me crazy. Okay. You know what happens. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, and unfortunately I have no control over those. And right. uh, and I try to plan for every eventuality and, uh, and sometimes you just can't plan for that kind of stuff, but I'll do some more research. Because I love doing these things. I taught for 30 years. So it's a great class. And I'll be there in the SIG tomorrow because uh, Al's class ended. Oh, okay. Well, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Glad you got found it worthwhile. Thanks for your time. You take care. Anybody else questions? A oh, good class, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I appreciate it. Good to see you tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have any bird pictures, but I may sit. Well, that's okay. No, excuse me. Tomorrow is a Wednesday, and I get my first vaccination. Ah, well, that's much more important. Yeah. By the way, you don't have to have pictures to come. Okay. Well, I know that. Yeah. I, mean, I just yeah. don't want to, you know. Cool. Be a pest where, or anything. Where do you post your pictures? Pardon? Where do you post pictures? For Actually, uh, are you registered for the SIG? So Did great. you go on? Uh, are you did you go to a kiosk and register for the SIG? Okay, you yeah. go where you're registered for this. What happens is they will send you, thanks, Scott. When they will send you um, a link to um, to the bird SIG, okay, 
but uh, I need your email address if you'd send that to me, uh, okay, and do that today, because that's the only way I can uh, know who's in it. And I send another email to you that has the attachment or the link to load pictures. It uses uh, um, Dropbox. And it's really easy, just drag and drop. And there's, we generally take about five. I can take everything from JPEGs to RAWs to anything. So, okay, but be sure and send me that email today, please. Okay, anybody else? Okay, all right. Thanks, Mike, see you tomorrow. Okay, Jim, see you tomorrow, man. Bye-bye. Okay, anybody else? If not, I'm a small dick. Thanks, Mike. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay.